If you ask anyone, when did World War II end? They would point to this very moment. The moment atomic bombs descended on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, killing hundreds of thousands of people. These bombings would eventually lead to the formal withdrawal of Japan from the World War, marking the end of the Axis powers and the victory of the Allied powers. And the man who would be credited with ending World War II would be one of the pioneering minds behind the atomic bomb, J. Robert Oppenheimer. But in truth, the nuclear bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima was not where World War II truly ended. By the time the bombs were dropped, Japan was reeling. It had been significantly weakened by conventional bombing and naval blockades, which had decimated its cities and infrastructure. It had already begun to show signs of surrender months before the bombing. Had the nuclear bombs not been used, it was only a matter of time until Japan surrendered. The Americans dropped the bombs in Japan, largely as a show of force, to scare the Soviet Union and any other power that might seek to challenge America. The reason why the war had largely ended by the time America dropped the nuclear bombs in Japan was because of a far less well-known genius whose work gave the Allied powers the ability to read secret German communications and consequently his vital work shortened World War II by at least two years. There are many parallels between the figures of J. Robert Oppenheimer and Alan Turing. But as Oppenheimer has recently come to mass public fame for his life, Alan Turing's remarkable life and brilliant mind have remained in the shadows of the historical record, despite arguably having a greater impact on World War II than Oppenheimer. It is estimated that Alan Turing saved the lives of over 14 million people and was critical to the Allied powers winning World War II. This is the story of Alan Turing the tragic story of the genius who won World War II. Born on June 23, 1912 in London, England, Alan Turing's life was fraught with obstacles from the very beginning. His father worked in the Indian civil service and as a result, Alan and his elder brother spent much of their childhood separated from their parents. The boys were left in the care of various foster homes in England while their parents lived in India. The early separation from his parents created a sense of isolation in young Alan. He was an introverted child, often misunderstood by his peers and teachers. Teachers. He excelled in maths and science but showed little enthusiasm for subjects like Latin and Greek, which were the hallmarks of a proper education in early 20th century Britain. His teachers' criticisms, rather than discourage him, strengthened his resolve. During these formative years, a pivotal moment came when he met Christopher Morecambe, a fellow student at Chalbon School. Christopher's ultimate death from tuberculosis devastated Alan. This loss taught Alan the fragility of life and the importance of making a meaningful impact. Due to his brilliance in maths and science, Alan Turing gained admission to the prestigious University of Cambridge where he would study mathematics. This is where his intellect would truly begin to shine. It was at Cambridge where he developed his passion for machines. Alan became fascinated with thinking machines, devices that could perform calculations and solve problems like a human mind. His groundbreaking paper on computational numbers laid the theoretical groundwork for what we now call the modern computer. Turing's concept of the Turing machine, a hypothetical device that could simulate any algorithm, became a cornerstone of computer science. In 1936, Turing moved to the United States to study under Alonzo Church at Princeton University, one of the leading figures in mathematical logic. Turing pursued a PhD in mathematics and completed it in 1938 at the age of 20. After receiving his PhD, he would return to the UK to continue his academic pursuits at Cambridge and work part-time at the Government Code and Cipher School. It was while working part-time at the GCCS that he would be introduced to the practical challenges of breaking encrypted communications and the methodologies used to tackle them. His natural aptitude for pattern recognition allowed him to excel in this field. About a year after his return to Britain, his life and the lives of millions of British people would be turned upside down. Germany had invaded Poland and the British government had a deal with Poland to protect it in case of an attack. So overnight, Britain had become embroiled in a full-scale war. As part of its war efforts, the British government set up a secret facility specifically to decode and decrypt secret Nazi communications. 
The facility was codenamed Blashley Park, which is where it was also located. Turing's ability to combine theoretical insights with practical problem solving made him a standout figure at the GCCS. Recognizing his potential, British intelligence recruited him to work for the secretive decryption facility at Blashley Park. The task at hand was immense. The Germans used a machine called the Enigma. It was designed to convert plain text messages into unintelligible cipher text and back again. Only trusted Nazi soldiers knew how to program the machine to decrypt messages. The Enigma machine could generate billions of possible combinations, changing its settings daily. Trying to figure out how it worked to decrypt German communications was like trying to find a single grain of sand on an endless beach. The possible combinations were an unfathomably large number. British intelligence had gotten hold of an Enigma machine smuggled out of the front lines by Polish soldiers. The team at Bleshley Park was tasked with figuring out how to configure the machine correctly such that it could decode any intercepted secret German communications. Using intercepted German communications that would be received in the morning, the team had only about 18 hours every day to decipher the communications and figure out the correct configuration of the Enigma. Because at the end of each day, the Enigma would reset and it would use new configurations to encrypt German messages, meaning the team had to start all over again with a new set of encrypted messages the following morning. The number of possible configurations for the Enigma was 159 million million million. Simply put, the task at hand was as close to impossible as anything can be which was not good for Britain's sake. After the fall of France in June of 1940, Britain was left to fend on its own against the mighty German military machine. German bombers devastated cities and caused widespread destruction. Britain's resources were stretched thin and the civil population faced increasing hardships as the war continued. The impact on Britain's infrastructure was profound. The bombing campaigns, especially in major cities like London, Coventry and Liverpool, destroyed factories, housing and vital supply lines. This made it difficult to manufacture war materials and left the civilian population vulnerable and demoralized. Alongside the physical damage, Britain faced a severe food crisis. British merchant ships that brought essential supplies were targeted by German U-boats. The so-called Battle of the Atlantic saw constant attacks on convoys, leading to a critical shortage of food, fuel and raw materials. Rationing became a way of life for British civilians and food shortages caused immense strain on the population. This forced the British government to tighten their food supply systems, but they still struggled to meet the needs of their people. Britain was not just fighting a conventional war, but was in a race against time to outlast the Axis powers and secure the necessary resources to sustain the war effort. If Bletchley Park's codebreakers failed to crack Enigma, Britain was facing the very real possibility of the clock running out on them and meeting the same fate as the now German-occupied France. It was clear that the codebreakers at Bletchley Park had to change their approach, otherwise Britain would run out of time. The traditional approach of pattern recognition coupled with trial and error was far too time-consuming. A radical new approach was necessary. Alan Turing approached the problem of the Enigma as a logical system. Rather than trying to crack individual messages manually, he sought to generalize the process and develop a system to automate the decryption. He focused on identifying weaknesses in the structure of the Enigma machine itself rather than its individual messages. He conceptualized the idea for a machine he called the bomb, which was a machine that could take encrypted German messages and decipher them quickly, providing the necessary configuration to be input in the Enigma to allow any German communication communications to be decrypted. Turing faced resistance not only from the Nazis but also from within his own team. But Turing was undeterred. He believed that the machine he was designing was the key to cracking the enigma. The process was grueling. Days turned into weeks weeks into months as Turing and his team worked tirelessly. They faced numerous setbacks from mechanical failures to strategic missteps. Each failure was a blow to morale. Limited resources and manpower also made the task at hand far more unachievable. The team wrote directly to British Prime Minister Winston Churchill explaining their difficulties. Churchill recognizing how critically important the work at Bletchley Park was responded with a letter titled Action This Day addressed the chief of the British Secret Service, in which he commanded that the team at Bletchley Park 
be given all necessary resources to do whatever they needed. From that point on, the goal seemed a bit more achievable. But there still was one problem. The intercepted messages were still as good as gibberish. German soldiers were instructed to use random words and avoid starting communications using the same phrases or repeating the same words in the same order at any point in the messages. That was of course, except for one phrase. The phrase that stood as a constant reminder to every German soldier of whose command they were under. That phrase of course, was the infamous Heil Hitler. Every single Nazi communication included this phrase. And with this realization, Alan Turing finally got the breakthrough he had been seeking. Using the phrase, Alan Turing inputted the plain text of the phrase, along with the encrypted messages, into the bomb machine. The bomb then tested thousands of settings to find a configuration that produced the given plain text from the cipher text. Turing's bomb successfully cracked the enigma. Suddenly, the Allied forces had access to vital intelligence about German military operations. It allowed the Allies to anticipate German military strategies, protect convoys from U-boat attacks, and make informed decisions about troop movements. They effectively had a guard view of the battlefield, seeing almost every German position in real time with updates from newly intercepted and decrypted secret German communications. You would assume that the British unleashed an onslaught like none other, attacking every German position and countering every German attack. But you'd be wrong. The British military did no such thing. Because had they immediately attacked on all intercepted information they were receiving, countering German attacks, the Germans would have figured out that their communications had been compromised. So they would have redesigned their system of communication, rendering Alan Turing's bomb useless. Add to that the fact that the British military had limited resources. They could not attack every single German position. So the British military had to be very strategic on which intelligence they would act on. They devised a statistical model that guided them on which intelligence they could act on and which not to act on. The model prioritized long-term strategic goals such as protecting vital supply convoys in the Atlantic. The British army would intentionally ignore certain decoded messages even when they revealed critical information that could lead to the death of British soldiers. This was done to maintain the appearance of randomness and avoid raising red flags with the German military top brass. The British never revealed to other allied nations that it had invented a machine that could essentially read the opposition's mind. They kept it a state secret for over 50 years. This was to ensure that if another war ever broke out, they would be able to use the bomb again without any adversary knowing. Alan Turing's machine and the statistical approach he devised would end up shortening the war by two years, saving an estimated 14 million lives and playing an essential part in the Allies winning the war. After this war, Blashley Park was dismantled and all the records of the top secret code breaking that was done there were largely destroyed. Alan Turing would never end up receiving any public praise for his work during World War II as all of it was highly classified for many decades after the war. Turing's personal life after the war was fraught with a lot of struggle. The man who should have been lauded as a war hero found himself arrested for indecency just a few years after the war. Before his arrest, Turing had initially reported a burglary into his house to the local police. Upon investigation, the police officers found that Turing had been having an intimate relationship with another man. In 1950s Britain, homosexuality was illegal in the United Kingdom at the time and Turing was charged with gross indecency. Turing was convicted and given a choice between imprisonment or chemical castration. He chose the latter, a decision that caused him immense physical and psychological suffering. On June 7, 1954, at the age of 41, Turing was found dead in his home. The cause of death was determined to be cyanide poisoning and a partially eaten apple was found near his body. While the apple was never tested, it is widely believed to have been the method he used to ingest the poison and that he had done it intentionally. A war hero so poorly mistreated who would die in disgrace at the hands of the very government he served for a crime that's not even a crime in our modern day. Thanks for watching.